There's a passage where the Buddha talks about the sense of the world that gave him Sangwega and inspired him to leave home and find a way out of the cycle of repeated death and birth and more death and more birth. He said the world was like a puddle of water that was drying up, and the puddle was filled with fish, struggling for that last little gulp of water and pushing one another out of the way. It just gave him a sense of despair. But then he said, well, where's the problem? And he looked inside his heart and he said, there's an arrow in the heart. If you can learn how to pull that arrow out, then that's the end of the problem. And the arrow, as he pointed out in another passage, is something we shoot ourselves with. The fact that you have a body means there's going to be pain. When they talk about intelligent design, it's Mark Twain had a great comment on that. He says, look at the way the world is put together, put together with intelligence, pure intelligence, no compassion, no heart. Look at all the sufferings that are that we are made subject to because we have the body. You look at every part of the body and there's a disease that goes with that part of the body. The body is designed to function for a while, and then it's not going to function. And it, just when you feel that you can depend on it, it starts to betray you. Of course, it's not really betrayal. It didn't enter into any agreement. The mind comes into the body and animates it, tries to get what it wants using the body. And the body will work for a while, and then this doesn't work, and then that doesn't work. It's inevitable there's going to be aging, illness, and death. That, the Buddha said, is the first arrow that we're shot with. But the one that goes into the heart is the second arrow. The way we get worked up over the pain. And that's the arrow that you remove. It's important to keep this in mind. We work with the breath, and it does help to alleviate a lot of the pains in the body when you won't learn how to work with it properly. But it can't take care of everything. Even a John Lee, who is a master of the breath suffered from a lot of pain that came with his heart disease. And John Fuhring was another master of the breath. He had some pretty painful conditions in his body as well. But we use the breath to soothe things as much as possible to get the mind in a position where it can look into the process of how it adds more unnecessary pain on top of the pain of the body. In other words, how it shoots itself with that second arrow and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and all the other extra arrows we shoot ourselves with. That's what we want to change. Because we find that when you remove those arrows and stop shooting yourself with them, there's no pain that weighs down on the mind. And this is an important lesson in our practice, that even though our past karma may be such that we have a body that has all these diseases, some of us have more diseases than others, but we don't have to suffer from them. And that's the difference between past karma and present karma. It's the present karma that makes all the difference. If your present karma is unskillful, you can suffer from even really fine conditions. If your present karma is skillful, then no matter how bad the situation in the body, the mind doesn't have to suffer. The minds of our hunts are totally free from suffering. They're like the rest of us in that their bodies have pain and pleasure, and neither pleasure nor pain. But none of these things make inroads into the mind. So the trick is training the mind. We train the breath, focus a lot of attention on the breath. Because it's one of our main tools in helping us settle down. But ultimately, the real issue is what the mind is doing. We mentioned this a little bit last night the way the mind puts together sensations, the way it puts together thoughts, puts together feelings, glues everything together. 
and then the things we glue together get so big and unwieldy that they weigh us down. So what we have to learn how to do is see them as distinct moments, distinct movements of the mind, and keep them distinct. Don't let them stitch together. Now first you have to stitch together the concentration in order to get your awareness to settle down. So you can see the movements of the mind that are weighing you down, that are stabbing you, piercing you. And then you can see the way you stitch them together, glue them together, to give them meaning, to make stories out of them. This is what fabrication is. And you can cut through the stories. Every story is made out of words, and each word is a distinct thing. And we put them together and they have meanings. But if you stare at a particular word for a while, even if it's a word in your own language, it gets pretty strange. And it helps to be able to take things apart like that. Try to notice what are the individual moments, what are the individual bits and pieces that you glue together. And just see them as individual pieces. And then you find that when they're individual like that, you can't use them to stab yourself or just to shoot yourself. It's the stories we build up around things. Our concern about gain, our concern about status, our concern about praise, criticism, our concerns about pleasure and pain become huge stories. But if you learn how to take them apart, you realize there's nothing there that needs to weigh the mind down. So this is how we begin to learn how not to shoot ourselves. Because what are we shooting ourselves over? Our attachment to things, our clinging to things, our sense of possession. This is mine, that's mine, both inside and out. We accumulate all these things and then they, they bury us. The Buddha talks about the mind that's awakened as a mind with nothing. It doesn't need anything, so it doesn't have to carry things around. So try to look at where you're carrying unnecessary burdens and shooting yourself with arrows where you don't have to shoot yourself. And ask yourself, how am I putting this story together? How am I putting this picture of the body sitting here together in such a way that it's adding to the suffering? This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath, is to see that we are actually fabricating even the way we breathe in a way that can cause suffering. When the Buddha talked about what sound like very abstract concepts, you know, ignorance is a condition for fabrication. He's talking about something very immediate and intimate. We have to put our experience together to make sense out of it, but we don't have to put it together. We can learn how to take these things apart, question the meanings we've given to things, look at the things from which we create that sense of meaning. In other words, bring knowledge to the process of fabrication, and a lot of them begin to defabricate. Instead of thinking about our thoughts in terms of their meanings, just look at them as movements in the mind. And try to look at what sponsors them, what causes them, what supports them, to the point where you realize you'd rather take it apart than take all these things apart. And you begin to realize that the things you thought you needed, you don't really need. You're better off without them. That mind with nothing, or the mind that has nothing, it's not poverty. And it turns out that when you need anything, it's there. You don't have to carry it around. And John Lee's example, or his analogy, is nice. He says you have all this wealth in your house, but you don't have to carry it around. You know that if you ever need it, it's there but you don't have to place it on your shoulders and carry it around. 
This is the inner wealth that, instead of dragging you down, it's almost as if it floats behind you. So even though you have nothing, you have access to all kinds of things. So if you have any stories that are weighing the mind down, learn how to take them apart bit by bit by bit and see how much lighter things are when they're not all glued together with meanings and storylines. And you find that the mind with nothing has everything it needs. <laughs>